My name is Ricardo Noguera, and I am delighted to be with you this morning and have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Professor John Bear Calicut. Professor Calicut is University Distinguished Research Professor Emeritus of the University of North Texas. He was instrumental in developing the field of environmental philosophy and in 1971 taught the world's first course in environmental ethics. He is co-editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Environmental Ethics and Philosophy an author or editor of a score of books, an author of dozens of journal articles, encyclopedia articles, and book chapters in environmental philosophy and ethics. From 1994 to 2000, Professor Calicut served as vice president, then president of the International Society for Environmental Ethics. Another distinguished position has held include visiting professor of philosophy at Yale University, the University of California, Santa Barbara, the University of Hawaii, and the University of Florida. He is perhaps best known as the leading contemporary exponent of Aldo Leopold land ethics, and has a variety and air ethics Thinking Like a Planet, published by Oxford University Press 2013, in resp response to climate change. This morning, we have the chance to listen to and enjoy his conference entitled Communitarian Animal Ethics, Its Merits and Challenges. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor John Calicut. Uh, thank you. Uh, can, I think you can hear me because I can hear myself uh, echoing here. Um, I, I'd like to say that this has been the most stimulating conference in, uh, on focused on animals uh, since I attended the International Whale Symposium uh, in the 1970s, and I would like to thank uh, Rod uh, and Anna Christina especially for your heroic um, uh, organizational and logistical uh, efforts here and I'm very very uh, grateful to um, to have been invited so thank you um, and I think we should give them all a hand since this is the last day <laughs> okay um, so I'd, I'd like to first address the emergence of uh, systematic animal ethics. By that I mean, you know, some philosophical uh, engagement with it. Uh, Peter Singer's uh, Animal Liberation, of course, began as a book review in the New York Review of Books in 1973. And just to sort of give a little parallel here, that same year saw the emergence of environmental ethics with the publication of Is There a Need for a New an Environmental Ethic by Richard Routley, later Sylvan, uh, and the Shallow and, and the Deep Long Range Ecology Movements, a summary by Arnie Ness. Uh, Routley was an Aussie and uh, Ness uh, Norwegian, so it began as a sort of international uh, uh, field. Uh, Tom Reagan first proposed extending rights to animals in the moral basis of vegetarianism published in the Canadian Journal of Philosophy in 1975. That same year, Holmes Ralston's Is There an Ecological Ethic? I forgot the uh, question mark there. Uh, was published in the um, mainstream uh, philosophy journal called Ethics. Uh, animal liberation is built, as most of you know, directly on classical utilitarian uh, theoretical foundations going back to Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th century. And uh, the, uh, this one quote captures uh, Bentham's uh, uh, animal ethic. Uh, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Singer thus identified sentience, the capacity to experience pleasure and pain, as the criterion for membership in the set of moral patients. 
Um, for happiness, defined in terms of pleasure and pain, contemporary uh, utilitarians have substituted preference satisfaction as the summum bonum uh, for, of utilitarian ethics. But the class of beings with preferences and that of, uh, and that of beings capable of suffering seems more or less to coincide. Uh, animal rights is built on deontological theoretical foundations going back to Immanuel Kant, uh, also in the late 18th century. For Kant, the question was indeed, can they reason? Assuming that animals cannot, he relegated them to the class of things. Reagan posited the argument from marginal cases, that's his quote, uh, which goes somewhat in, um, in condensed form as follows. Some humans, pre-rational infants, the non-rational mentally disabled, uh, the post-rational demented cannot reason. Thus, if reason is the criterion for membership in the set of moral patients, such humans are excluded and may be treated as we treat excluded animals. Because that is morally repugnant, we must identify a criterion that includes the human so-called marginal cases, a rather unfortunate uh, and insensitive term, but nonetheless, that was his. Uh, and so Reagan argued that being a subject of a life that can go better or worse for them entitles such animals to basic rights. Um, now, I'm wanting to suggest that there, that though utilitarianism and deontology seem very, very different, they share two basic assumptions. One, moral agents and patients are individuals belonging to an exclusive moral club based on a membership qualification. For utilitarianism, being sentient and capable of suffering, for Kantian deontology, being rational and autonomous, and from, for Reaganic deontology, being the subject of a life. Uh, this is an application in moral philosophy of the ancient Aristotelian essence accident ontology so far as ethics is concerned. Some beings have an essential characteristic or property that makes them members of the set of moral patients. All other characteristics, race, creed, color, but also the number of legs, I'm now quoting Bentham, the velocity of the skin, the termination of the Oz sacrum, that's the tailbone, uh, to quote Bentham again, are accidents qua moral status. Um, so continued with the same, these shared assumptions, all beings who possess the moral essence, sentience, robust sec subjectivity, possess it equally. The font of ethics in moral agents as opposed to patients is human reason in its most basic form, self-consistency or the logical law of non-contradiction. For example, in deontology, if I will that it be a universal law that everyone tell the truth and keep their promises, then I am caught in a contradiction if I tell a lie or break a promise. In the case of utilitarianism, treating equal interests unequally is inconsistent. To treat equal interests equally is therefore called the principle of rationality as well as the principle of impartiality. So despite interminable and intractable disputes among the passionate partisans of deontology and, and utilitarianism, their common assumptions unite them as a prevailing uber paradigm in mainstream moral philosophy, which I'm just calling for the sake of uh, simplicity, rational individualism. And despite uh, the subsequent uh, refinement of animal liberation and animal rights over the decades following the 1970s, these two approaches still dominate sys systematic animal ethics. And note virtue ethics in its original Aristotelian expression is also a variant of the rational individualism uber paradigm in 20th century moral philosophy. The Aristotelian virtues are a mean, a literal ratio between too much and too little. And human eudaimonia, happiness, to, is to realize the potential of human nature to govern the animal appetites and passions by rational principle. 
The deployment of this uber paradigm in 20th century animal ethics results in what I believe to be a counterintuitive and also impracticable one-size-fits-all ethic for animals that qualify for membership in the set of moral patients. Humans, gibbons, gibbon apes, lemurs, whales, elephants, opossums, brown rats, voles, moles, skunks, squirrels, bats, the list goes on, all have equal rights. And those rights must be protected not only from human violators, but from non-human violators as well. Vigorously, by the way, contested by Reagan, but uh, willingly embraced, it seems, by Steve Saponsis and more recently by um, Oscar, our friend and colleague, Oscar Orta. Uh, or humans, all other mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish are all equally entitled to equal consideration of their equal interests. Now, um, in Animal Liberation, a Triangular Affair, published uh, in Environmental Ethics in 1980, uh, I drew a sharp distinction, a uh, sharp contrast between the holistic land ethic sketched by Aldo Leopold in the Sand County Almanac and individualistic uh, animal ethics developed most notably by uh, Singer and Reagan. The land ethic focuses on what I call transorganismic entities, species, biotic communities, ecosystems. These are the objects of actual environmental concern. Environmental professionals such as Aldo Leopold, a wildlife conservationist uh, who died in 1948, are not professionally concerned uh, with individual animal welfare, although they might be as human beings and in their private uh, practice. Um, so the, 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 the uh, Leopold coming from a, a, a background in biology um, was familiar with ethics, not from this philosophical tradition, which I have just reviewed, but from a parallel tradition uh, in biology. So it, it, it comes to perhaps news to many of my colleagues in philosophy that uh, biologists have been um, dealing with the question of ethics uh, since uh, Charles Darwin's uh, Descent of Man, in, uh, to which Darwin uh, in which Darwin devoted two chapters to the moral sense. And I think that this captures Darwin's understanding of the origin of ethics. He says, no tribe could hold together if murder, robbery, treachery, etc., were common. Hence, such crimes within the limits of the same tribe are branded with everlasting infamy. So if the, and, and the Darwin's reasoning is this, if the tribe cannot hold together, then its members would perish and fail to reproduce. So ethics evolved by natural selection as a means to social organization, vital to the inclusive fitness of individual members. So from this we can derive a lemma, and that is that ethics and society are correlative. And the corollary to that is that as society evolves, ethics evolves in parallel. Um, Darwin adopted the moral philosophy of David Hume, who was roughly a contemporary of um, Jeremy Bentham and an elder contemporary of uh, Bentham and Kant. According to Hume, the wellspring of all action, including ethical action, is feeling, emotion, passion, affect in a word, not reason. Ethical actions are motivated by the moral sentiments, among them sympathy and compassion, also a general feeling of beneficence, but, but feelings as well directed toward various wholes, such as loyalty and patriotism directed towards institutions, for example, the church, and to nation states. 
Darwin's account of the origins and development of ethics begins with the parental and filial affections which bond uh, the family society, as Hume denominated it, and gradually extend to more distantly uh, related kin and non-kin associates. Um, in the philosophy of David Hume, reason has a subordinate but vital role to play in Hume's moral philosophy. The moral sentiments are underdetermined. Culture, worldview determines how the moral sentiments are engaged and toward whom or what they are directed. Reason serves as a correlative to the culturally determined objects of the moral sentiments. Darwin was vigorously opposed, for example, to slavery and criticized the race theories of his contemporaries that were used to justify it. Reason traces the often complicated train of causes and effects. Darwin pointed out the indirect destructive effects, for example, on society of inattention to the so-called self-regarding virtues. So, um, to uh, a, a, another quotation from Darwin which captures this, this idea that as the community or society expands, eth ethics expands correlative to it. So the first human societies were extended families or clans. Uh, they merged to form tribes. Tribes merged to form ethic uh, ethnic nations, uh, such ethnic nations merged to form nation states. And finally, uh, in my own lifetime, and in many of yours, we are now sort of experiencing the emergence of a global human community or society, which we could call the global village. Darwin anticipated this. He says, as man advances in civilization, and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. Now, Basically, in developing the land ethic, Aldo Leopold built on these Darwinian foundations. As I like to put it, he just added icing on the Darwinian cake. And he developed the land ethic based upon the idea that there was a, a, a concept in ecology called the community concept or paradigm. The biota is organized, according to Charles Elton, like human societies. Each plant and animal occupies a niche, a role, or profession in the economy of nature. Thus, as Leopold builds on Darwin, we have the extended family, the ethnic nation, the nation state, the global village, and now we begin to realize that we also exist in a biotic community as well as these uh, other human communities. And so the summary moral maxim of the Leopold land ethic is a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. That's sort of the, what I, we could call the golden rule of the Leopold land ethic. So this leads then to a sort of generalized communitarian foundations of the Leopold land ethic. Moral duties and obligations are generated by community membership. Each of us are simultaneously members of many communities, families, neighborhoods, departments for us and uh, academics, universities also for us academics, municipalities, provinces, nation states, the global village, and the biotic community. And each community generates its particular set of duties and obligations. The general principle of communitarian ethics is a thing is right if it preserves the integrity, stability, and beauty of the 
whatever community, fill in the blank, family, municipality, nation state, biotic community. The particular structure of each uh, community determines the particular duties and obligations generated by each community. For example, the family community generates duties of sexual fidelity between partners because in infidelity may threaten its integrity and stability. The national community generates a duty of fair distribution of resources because great inequality threatens its integrity and stability. Patriotism, in other words, demands fair uh, uh, wealth uh, distribution. So here's just a sort of summary. Family duties, love and care for children, aged parents uh, provide stuff. Uh, neighborly duties, you can borrow and loan from your neighbors, pick up their mail when they're on vacation, watch out for burglars. Departmental duties, go to committee meetings, teach a fair load. University duties, participate in faculty self-governance. Municipal duties, vote, vote in local elections, go to town hall meetings. Uh, province duties, vote in provincial elections, environmental activism, nation state duties, vote in national elections, serve in the military, global village duties, stick up for and respect universal human rights. Now, the moral status of individual wild animals in the land community. Uh, Charles Elton characterized the structure of bio communities as a trophic pyramid. The currency of the economy of nature is energy as it passes from stomach to stomach, not from hand to hand. The integrity, stability, and beauty of biotic communities depends on animals at levels ab above eating those uh, at levels below. As plain members and citizens of biotic communities, humans should strive to keep these trophic relationships intact by non-interference or by active intervention when necessary, as for example, releasing uh, key, uh, keystone predator wolves into the Yellowstone ecosystem. Intervening in the economy of nature to protect the rights of prey animals from violation by their predators or to save sentient animals from suffering from pred predation or other vicissitudes of life in the wild, as uh, Sapansis and Orta appear to advocate, would entail ecological collapse. From the point of view of the land ethic of helping wild animals in this way is the end point to which the logic of animal rights and animal liberation lead, then that constitutes a reductio ad absurdum of these theories of animal ethics. And this was something I think that Tom Reagan recognized and uh, resisted. What about mixed, that's the sort of wild communities, what about mixed human-animal communities? In Animals and Why They Matter, uh, published in 1983, uh, Mary Midgley introduced the concept of mixed human-animal uh, communities. The animal members of these communities are domestic, not wild. Midgley claimed that domestication was not a matter of capture and enslavement, but one involving the innate soci sociality of the animals as well as the humans in the process of domestication. A sort of social contract ensued. Since 1983, theories of domestication have been uh, greatly advanced in no small part by the technology of comparative genetics, but Midgley's basic hypothesis has been largely confirmed. Current theory suggests that animal domestication occurred along three paths. First, commensals. Uh, the, the, in fact, the first domesticated uh, animal was the wolf who became the dog. Some wolf packs, the, uh, the theory goes, uh, followed human groups feeding on leftovers. A few bold pack members drew nearer to uh, human encampments taking handouts then cooperating in the pursuit and capture of pay, uh, prey. So, and this pathway includes house cats and chickens, it is alleged, according to the literature I read recently, in any case. Uh, predation uh, uh, f then uh, sort of uh, evolved into wildlife management and fin finally into domestication of prey species. Humans got more and more involved, the theory goes, 
in protecting their prey from other predators and facilitating feeding and reproduction. And so this pathway includes sheep, cattle, pigs, reindeer, and water buffalo. And then finally, directed uh, domestication. Once domestication uh, of commensal and prey animals enable people to imagine a wild to domestic state or process, horses and donkeys were deliberately domesticated as partners in work, sport, and war. So this leads then to a nuanced communitarian animal ethics, not a, as opposed to a one-size-fits-all. Fit, Humans and animals form a variety of mixed communities which generate a correlative variety of duties and obligations. Probably the most common current mixed community is the human-animal family community, in which dogs and cats are second-class children. Humans have a duty to shelter and feed their pets, provide them with vet veterinary care, and shower them with love and affection. And dogs, especially, less so with cats, as I'm painfully aware, uh, have some reciprocal duties to be gentle with, the, with and tolerant of human infants and children, not to urinate and defecate indoors, and not to, claw, uh, not to chew uh, shoes and furniture. I was about to say claw furniture, but my cats do that. Uh, and above all, to be loyal to their human family and reciprocate the love and affection. They are extended. But pets can be euthanized when old and infirm, which is not something that is widely accepted among uh, other family members, human family members. And we badly judge those who abrogate these moral strictures. There's families. Uh, further to nuanced communitarian ethics. The animals that have for many centuries become associates of humans at work, war, and sport are not ersatz family members. I heard a very interesting presentation yesterday about the charge of the Light Brigade, and not only did six or 700 uh, soldiers die in this famous uh, event, but also a number of horses. Um, horses and donkeys live in corrals or barns. The bonds are different, but often no less intimate. The names of some have come down to us practically alongside those of Achilles and Odysseus. For example, Alexander's war horse, Bucephalus, whose death he mourned as grievously as he did that of his closest uh, human companion, Hephaestion. Here's an interesting uh, sort of legal application of communitarian animal ethics. The statutes of Texas outlaw the sale of horse meat originating in Texas for human consumption, and not just in Texas, not just in the US, but anywhere in the world. And the law has nothing to do with human health or animal cruel cruelty, because horse meat is legal for pet food. It's rather based on a kind of human-animal mixed community that involves horses in the actual history and imaginary of the state. It's a communitarian moral law, in effect. The Midgelian social contract between humans and their domesticated prey has been grievously abrogated. There is absolutely no communitarian ethical justification for the factory farm. So here's a few thought experiments that I would like to uh, under, to share with you. What if all this philosophers are, are, are uh, entitled to, to make thought experiments just to see where the argument goes? So what if all humans all over the world suddenly became moral vegans, and existing domestic prey animals were allowed to live out their lives and die a natural death. The only reason they exist in such huge numbers is because they are bred and raised to be sold for human consumption. Absent consumption by humans, each species would dwindle to a few thousand specimens bred and kept as museum relics. 
Now, this outcome, interestingly, would be the least problematic from the point of view of the land ethic. Much land now devoted to pasture and feed crops could then be available for wildlife and biotic communities and ecological restoration. And from the point of view of the new earth ethic, which I have also developed and championed, animal agriculture produces a huge amount of methane, a potent greenhouse gas, so its elimination would significantly help mitigate uh, climate change. Further to these thought experiments, what if all humans all over the world suddenly became moral beacons? and existing domestic prey animals were allowed to live out their lives and die a natural death. There is at least a fair question to be asked about animal liberation. In the name of reducing animal suffering is one morally justified means of doing so, simply reducing the number of animals that suffer from millions of specimens to a few thousand that do not. The question might even be more uncomfortable if asked about animal rights. If among the basic rights that all subjects of life should have is the equal right to life, is it consistent to deny any life at all to many millions of animals? A more likely scenario uh, is that um, uh, is, is developed uh, uh, here following. Uh, EU countries have made efforts to improve the lives of domesticated prey animals. Suppose that trajectory is expanded and sustained and animal welfare laws everywhere become stricter and more strictly enforced until the happiness quotient of the animal beneficiaries exceeds their suffering quotient and suppose they receive a quick and painless death. That brings to the, to the fore another fair question for animal liberation. Would an animal liberationist then have a positive duty to eat meat and thus support humane animal agriculture for the sake of maximizing the total amount of pleasure in the world? The pleasure the animals experience while living, the gustatory pleasure of the humans that consume them, and the moral pleasure of the humans that consume them in believing that they are doing the right thing. Um, so let's look at this from the communitarian pro approach considering the domestic, uh, domesticated prey community. Humans are obligated to uphold their end of the domesticated, uh, domestication social contract. To comfortably feed, shelter, and protect domesticated prey animals and give them a quick and painless death in exchange for which the animals are spared the often painful rigors of wildlife, exposure to the elements, seasonal hunger, and eventually predation by a wild predator. For their part, humans get to consume them. Factory farming domesticated prey animals exists in order to lower costs. Ethical farming of domesticated prey animals is much more costly, and those costs would ultimately be borne by consumers. Meat would then would become more expensive, resulting in less consumption and lower populations of domesticated prey animals. Um, again, from the communitarian approach uh, and multiple community memberships, as noted from the point of view of the land ethic, significantly lower populations of domestic prey animals would make land now devoted to pasture and feed crops available for wildlife and biotic communities. And from the point of view of the new earth ethic, animal agriculture produces a huge amount of methane, a potent greenhouse gas, as also noted. Thus, lower populations of domestic prey animals would help mitigate climate change. And from the point of view of all our human community memberships, from the family community to the global village, significantly reduced com consumption of animal foods would lower rates of obesity and other morbidities attended upon a meat-centered diet. Now I'm going to end, this is the last slide, with some fair questions for the communitarian animal ethics. If we're in the Anthropocene, are there any genuinely wild animals? Are our wildlife 
preserves just large unfenced zoos? If so, don't wild animals deserve the same care, feeding, and protection as zoo animals? Perhaps this Sapansis orta interventionist animal ethic makes sense in the, con in the context of the Anthropocene. Further, the more we discover about animal consciousness, the more closely it resembles human consciousness. Thus, the more our sympathies are engaged. Are animals not deserving of the moral consideration resembling that which humans deserve? And finally, uh, we are also discovering that plants may in some ways be conscious and communicative. Do they, or should they, also engage our sympathies? Are they not deserving of moral consideration resembling that which humans deserve? What then is it ethical to eat? Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Interesting talk. And we have uh, 20 minutes for question. Uh, please, short question. No presentation, no conference. I don't, this is probably an obscure reference for some people, but every time I hear the idea of an animal social contract, that includes the quick and painless death of an animal. I always think of the scene from the Marx Brothers where they say there's no sanity clause. Am I the, probably the only person who knows that? Um, so in other words, I'm not sure that the non-human animals read the page that says they get a quick painless death. And so I'm not sure to what extent we can uh, use this hypothetical social contract to which they're not a, a knowledgeable party as a means or as a justification of what we might want to do to them, if that makes sense as a question. Um, th this, of course, is not something that I work on as a, uh, uh, as a scientist. The, 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 um, the history, the process of domestication. I was just sort of reporting uh, what seems to be the latest uh, views on that. Now, to call this in some ways a, a kind of implicit social contract. That's a, theor that, that's a philosophical label to put on uh, the, uh, this, this, the, the sort of empirical research, historical research that uh, has, goes under the uh, rubric of domestication science. So, that, I mean, then what we're talking about is the value of this as a metaphor, as a, uh, an analogy. And um, I suppose it could be uh, certainly challenged, as you're suggesting it should be. So I, it's just a, how cl the question is, how closely does it resemble uh, what we could think of as a, a social con contract among human beings? Yes. Um, so if I understand your uh, presentation correctly, it seems to be supportive of what is generally referred to as uh, humane or compassionate meat, at least in a possible or a theoretical sense. So I'm wondering if, uh, as we know, all humane or so-called humane or compassionate meat involves some type of sexual coercion in the breeding programs. Um, how do you reconcile that intrinsic facet of the industry with a um, communitarian ethic uh, that you're supporting? Um, in some ways, what I'm trying to address is a, a, the, the possible rather than the ideal. And the, it, as it seems to me, what is actually possible is um, and the evolution of legislation and policy that increasingly um, leads to uh, 
a more humane animal agriculture. And what seems to me, at least this point, hard to envision on a global scale is a universal uh, vegan uh, diet and the total elimination of animal agriculture. And so I'm, I'm trying to provide a moral framework in which we can then begin to uh, envision and formulate policies that lead to a better outcome for animals that are caught up in um, animal agriculture and, and, and guide its trajectory in the best direction that's actually possible. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I, maybe it might be a question along similar lines. Okay. But um, you mentioned that uh, caring, you know, uh, giving this amount of care and t having this social contact with the animals with that, uh, that we take care for and then eventually kill and consume. You mentioned that this would, this would increase the cost, which I think, of course, is true for the consumer. But what I'm wondering there is if we have a communitarian ethic, um, thinking about, like I said, making a comparison to humans, um, in so far as we have a community, we think that we should have certain notions of respect towards the bodies of those that were deceased. And so I'm a little troubled at thinking that, like, if I have a communitarian ethic with an animal, and I live and work with it alongside it, then I can then just sell its body to other people. Um, so the, the focus of the question is on the respect for the, uh, the, the animal body and then uh, commodifying it in a, in, in, in a, uh, uh, a commercial way. I suppose uh, you know I would have to have to agree, and uh, to to um, one of one of the the areas of research uh, that I've undertaken in the past is to look at um, American Indian and other indigenous uh, practices where uh, the the uh, killing and consumption of um, uh, animals is concerned, wild animals. And one of, the, it, one of the things that is most outstanding in, this, uh, re, um, in, in these practices is the idea of respect, respect for the animals, respect for uh, that, that translates into uh, the modes of uh, distribution uh, and, and consumption. So um, that then, you know, problematizes uh, the commercial uh, uh, aspect of the animal in industry. But then, aren't we prob problematizing today uh, capitalism in general? And so, uh, one then uh, 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 m might begin to envision policies that are consistent with a kind of post-capitalist. Uh, uh, society, which would involve uh, uh, s studying, uh, borrowing from, if, and uh, certainly, but not appropriating uh, the um, uh, the sort or learning from the traditions of indigenous people in terms of their relationship with the animals that they kill and eat. Let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. That was so. Uh, a very stimulating, thoughtful, and lucid presentation, and provoking a lot of thoughts. And I suppose I have to come back to the kind of world we're in at present. And um, so, ask you within your framework, how do we account for the kind of resistance to the communities that you set up? ending in global, and, um, and what seems to be the individual preference for identification with groups that cut across logics, the logic of community, 
And so in our human framework, it suggests a kind of um, individualism that's perhaps not rational. And so my question to you is, is your concept of communitarian based on the notion of an ideal of rational behaviour that we can't quite realise and therefore can't easily implement in relation to the human-animal um, bond relationship? Well, I, I think um, somewhat ironically, the 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 community, the, found, the, the ultimate foundations of the communitarian ethic going all the way back to David Hume are the, the moral sentiments. It's that ethics arises from the heart rather than from the, uh, uh, from the head, uh, so to speak. It's, uh, it's a matter of, of our, our uh, feelings and passions ultimately. Um, Hume distinguished between two sorts or two classes, the self-oriented uh, passions or affections and the other-oriented ones. And the other-oriented ones are the source of um, uh, ethics, sympathy, uh, beneficence, uh, loyalty, uh, love, uh, are, are the, the, the the source in the human psyche from which uh, ethics um, arise, and so it's it, it, these are the, the 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 things that bond us to uh, communities, and that would include the the mixed communities as as well as our relationship even to the um, uh, uh, to the to the biotic community, and once again. I think that the the um, that we have lots to learn from uh, indigenous peoples in their relationship to their their uh, wild communities. I, I totally agree with that last point and actually um, support that as a way forward. But I'm very conscious that my own contact in relation to indigenous communities is that they're very rule bound. And uh, so coming back to this issue, which I agree with and is my great curiosity, how emotion works, I'm very conscious that feeling is a completely unreliable marker of how we form bonds. Because uh, people, humans, uh, just as easily walk out on a lover as an animal they proclaim to love. So I, I'm not sure where we go from there, and it is my question a bigger question. I'm not expecting you to answer it, mm -hmm. but any hints? <laughs> so so the, the challenge is really to the idea that uh, that feelings are in any way really reliable. They're fickle and uh, often contradictory and, and that, uh, that we need a, a rational check somehow or to substitute reason for feeling as as our touchstone in, um, in our moral deliberations. It, it, that's the point. Um, and what am I to say <laughs> in regard to that? Uh, except to, to suggest that it, it, it is, I tried to point out, but per, perhaps not with the, uh, with the uh, with, uh, as effectively as I might have, that um, reason is a very important part of uh, the, uh, the, the communitarian or the Humean sentiment-based uh, ethic that it, we, we tend to think it's, it's either one or the other, but... But we're back to Aristotle then, aren't we? I, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll end and let someone else... Thank you. Hope to continue this discussion. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, I just wanted to ask what you thought about the idea that um, if we are to abolish only factory farmed meat and we keep this sort of idea of humane meat and then there's less meat, um, 
what about the idea about feelings of construction of the self and that then meat will only be available to the higher classes and people who are able to attain it and then will take on kind of a symbolic role as what represents wealth or good and mm. then it therefore will start the cycle again of meat being what people want to attain thereby mm. finding ways to lower the prices once again and starting the cycle that we're in mm -hmm. over again. Mm -hmm. I, I can only say that that, uh, that is, is a problem that, um, that has occurred to me, in fact, just as I was making the presentation, that that might be, in fact, uh, one of the uh, untoward and unfortunate uh, uh, consequences. So I can, only, I can only agree with you that this is, this is a liability of this um, uh, sort of approach in which, uh, the, once again, we have a sort of elitist consumption uh, and it becomes a sim symbol of uh, wealth and prestige and power over others and so on. So that's, that. You know, I, I have no, no answer to that except to say that, well, um, uh, that's something that I anticipated and, and uh, it, it, it's, a pr it's a problem with this particular uh, uh, approach. I was wondering in this uh, communitarian um, project, um, what about the uh, hierarchies of um, moral uh, principles when you say that um, in raising the animals um, there should be moral standards and standards uh, that fit uh, animals' welfare or well-being? And then um, after this there comes the moral principle of uh, enjoyment and pleasure for humans. Um, and this is worth more, so I, I just don't understand this hierarchy of um, moral principles that you presented? Um, really, this is uh, something that uh, we can uh, turn to, to Bentham uh, as, as the paradigm here. Bentham, as we know, said the question is not can they uh, reason or can they talk or can they suffer, and that passage uh, is in a, in a um, a paragraph which also references uh, human slavery. Um, and yet Bentham, the para paragon of utilitarianism, was quite happy to consume on the basis of the very argument that I uh, outlined here uh, in my talk, which comes actually directly from Bentham. Uh, so um, apparently, it, it, but, but as, and I brought this up when uh, we were in the Tom Reagan panel as a challenge to uh, uh, Dale uh, Jameson, and Dale said at the time, well, Bentham lived in very different circumstances than we do, and basically what that referred to was there were no factory farms uh, in the uh, late 18th century, uh, and so that argument uh, that Bentham made was, was, he was perfectly, he thought it was perfectly consistent with his view of uh, animal sentience uh, uh, to be, uh, for him uh, t to, to, to consume animals. And he argued basically on that, uh, that same ground. But I think we just moved a little bit further than Bentham now, and we know a lot about animal cognition and uh, the inner life of cows, etc. you know? And um, so we couldn't just go back to Bentham and say, um, and, and retrieve his um, argumentation, I think. So maybe it would be um, a good idea to move a little bit further and to well, recognize well, the animal personhood or more subjectivity. Recognize the animal person and the animal subject. Yes. And this is this, uh, the very last slide. Uh, that um, of my talk here is that increasingly um, uh, ethological research is revealing the robustness of and 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 the uh, complexity of uh, animal consciousness and the animal person, and so um, this is something that I want to acknowledge and at the, and at the same time uh, take into account as my own thinking about animal ethics is evolving. And quite frankly, 
I, I'm not there yet. I, I haven't been able really to, to fully assimilate this information uh, that we are receiving and to see what kinds of consequences that has for this sort of uh, communitarian uh, approach uh, to animal ethics. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, tr I'm, I'm struggling with this and I am also um, trying to stay abreast of the literature. There's been, a, there's been a, a, a kind of silent revolution in ethology, which some of the people like Mark Beckoff and uh, Franz Duval, who have been in the, in the field uh, for many years, um, comment on. And that is, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, there, there was a vice grip in animal studies uh, of uh, behaviorism. You could, only, you could only describe the external behavior of animals in any um, reference to uh, states of consciousness, even s pain and sentience was literally professional suicide for uh, those students. And now we have um, a, a, the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction and uh, uh, there's the, the anthropomorphism is uh, openly embraced uh, uh, by uh, contemporary uh, ethologists, vindicating people like Mark and Franz Duval, who uh, were uh, were ostracized in uh, in, in in an earlier uh, era. And so we, uh, I have to like I, to, to to listen to this and to. And, and to try to accommodate it in my own thinking about animal ethics. So, it's mm, we don't have time. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Professor Calicut. Oh. Yes, I 